Hi, Integrated Science. This is Ms. Satterley. I'm going to go over the classifying matter slideshow. So first, uh, pure substance. A pure substance is matter that always has the, exactly the same composition. It's going to have a uniform composition and a fixed ratio. There are two types of pure substances, elements and compounds. So in the picture here, we actually have two pictures. Over here, this is copper. And over here, this is actually called copper sulfate. So copper by itself has that specific copper color that we all know. It's the color of pennies and other things. But the thing about copper is when copper actually forms bonds and compounds, it changes the color completely. So any kind of compound that has copper in it is actually going to be blue. So that's why copper sulfate looks blue or copper chloride also is blue. What are elements? Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances, and they are composed of only one type of atom. In the picture here, we have a picture of some mercury that's been poured out. Mercury is one of the only metals that, or, sorry, mercury is one of the only elements that is liquid at room temperature. The other one is bromine, which is a halogen, which is a reddish brown liquid. Elements are made up of one type of atom. The atom is the smallest unit of matter. Here's a picture of an atom. Atoms include electrons, protons, and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are found within the nucleus of the atom, while electrons are found around the outside in the electron cloud or orbital. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative. So that is the structure of the atom. Elemental states. So element states can either be solid, gas, or liquid. Most elements are going to be solid at room temperature. All of our metals are solid, but many of our nonmetals are also solid. Some are gas. Halogens, which is group 7 on the periodic table, would include fluorine and chlorine, iodine, bromine. Some of them are gas. Now, bromine, you see at the bottom, is a liquid. It also is a type of halogen, but it's the only halogen that isn't a gas. Noble gases, which is group 8 on the periodic table, are all gases, and those are our elements that are inert, which means they're not reactive. Let's look at what the periodic table is broken up into. So this is a picture of the periodic table, a piece of it. First thing I want to focus on is the chemical symbol. Chemical symbols are found in the center of a piece of the periodic table. Chemical symbols are either represented by one or two letters. They always have a capital letter followed by a lowercase letter. So that is the specific way that you are supposed to write chemical symbols. Chemical symbols are either named after the English or Latin names of different elements. An example of this is carbon. Carbon is the English, so we see a C. But we have gold, which is AU, which is actually named after the Latin name for gold, which is aurium. There's also other elements that have the Latin names, which includes lead, which is PB, mercury, which is HG, silver, which is AG, and copper, which is CU. So those are all named after the Latin names. So again, I just mentioned this, but I want to stress it. When you are writing chemical symbols, the first letter is always capitalized. Proper block letters. And the second letter is always lowercase. Let's talk about compounds. Compounds are substances that always contain two or more elements joined in a fixed proportion. Two examples of compounds include water and sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a fancy word for table salt, which is pictured in this slide. Compounds have different properties than elements that make up the compound. So I already used the example of copper and copper sulfate, but here's another example. So water. Water is a non-dangerous essential compound that every living thing needs in order to survive. Now water is made up of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, which are both gases, but they happen to be highly flammable gases. But when they react and form water, it takes away those dangerous properties. So that is just to show you that compounds can be very, very different from the elements that make them up. 
Now let's talk about mixtures. Mixtures are not pure substances. Mixtures are gonna have substances that don't have a fixed composition and properties of different mixtures are going to vary. So in the picture here, we have a picture of tap water and distilled water. Distilled water is going to be a pure substance. It's gonna be a pure substance called a compound. Tap water is not. Tap water is gonna have contaminants in it. We add things to our tap water such as fluoride and there's chlorine to keep it clean. So there's different things in it. So therefore tap water is considered a mixture, but distilled water is a compound. Now there are different types of mixtures. We have heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Hetero means different. So a heterogeneous mixture is gonna have parts of the mixture that are noticeably different from one another. So in this picture, we have sand. Sand is a type of heterogeneous mixture. It's made up of different compounds. And you can see there's different colors and also different sizes. Now a homogeneous mixture is when substances are evenly dispersed. Mixture classification. They're based on the largest particle a mixture can be classified. We have solution, suspension, and a colloid. First one is solution. A solution is a mixture where the substance is dissolved completely. So this is a type of homogeneous mixture. Now a suspension is a heterogeneous mixture that separates into layers over time. When a suspension is first mixed, it's going to look cloudy and that's because of large particles of scattered light. So if you put sand or dirt into water and mix it up, it's going to be cloudy. But if you let it sit over time, eventually the water will become clear again because all of the particles are too heavy to stay suspended in the water, so they will fall to the bottom. Last one is a colloid. A colloid is a a substance that contains particles that are intermediate in size between small and large particles in a suspension. The most classic example of a colloid is milk. It is evenly separated over time and it can scatter light the same way as the suspension can, but it's not gonna separate as quickly. So if you let milk sit out for a long time, eventually it will spoil and form layers, but that's because the different particles are starting to settle. But generally, milk is going to stay in its suspended state for a much longer time. Now let's look at solute. Solute and solvents. Solute is defined as a substance that's dissolved in a liquid or a substance whose particles are dissolved in a solution. That's basically the same thing. So a solute can be a lot of things. A solute is usually a solid that's dissolved in a liquid. Now, the liquid that a solute is going to dissolve in is called the solvent. Two definitions for solvent I'm going to put include a liquid that dissolves a solid and a substance in which a solute dissolves. Now, solvents and solutes mix together to make solutions, and solutions are going to have different solubilities. Solubility is the maximum amount of a solute that dissolves in a given amount of solvent at a constant temperature. There are different types of solutions. We have saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. And these three types of solutions are based on the amount of solute that is present in the solvent. So a saturated solution is a solution that contains as much solute as the solvent can hold at a given temperature. So you can kind of think that that solvent is full of solute and it can't hold anything else. Next one is unsaturated solution. Unsaturated solution is going to have less solute in it than the solvent can actually hold. So you can keep adding solvent to an unsaturated solution and you can get more of it to dissolve. But then we have a supersaturated solution. Supersaturated solutions are solutions that contain more solute than it can normally hold at a given temperature. Supersaturated solutions are very unstable. In your chemical versus physical change lab, you actually have a video where you see an example of a supersaturated solution. It's actually pictured here, or at least a picture of it. So this type of solution, what happens, it's so saturated that any kind of force is going to the solute to come out of the liquid. So in this picture, what would have happened is they would have touched the surface of that liquid and it would have caused the solute to come out of the solvent or making it form a solid. So it's actually pretty cool. Hopefully you enjoyed that part or you've gotten to that part of the video. 
so that is a super saturated solution. The last slide for this. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Have a wonderful day. Bye.